That call to worship animation was provided by Delia Carrington. Thanks for that, Delia. So, welcome to worship on Palm Sunday, when we remember what's known as Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We begin with a traditional hymn which expresses our awe and wonder at the power of God as it's revealed to us in every aspect of being, and particular as it's revealed to us in Jesus Christ. It's from Singing the Faith, number 113, I worship the King, all glorious above. And now will you pray with me? Father, we approach you in this time of worship like pilgrims on the dusty roads into Jerusalem, gathering for the festival. We approach with awe and wonder because we recognise that if judged by human standards, we don't deserve to be in your presence. We've got things wrong in our lives, hurt other people by our indifference, marred your image in us by our selfishness and ignored your call to righteousness. And, and yet we come singing our hosannas. We come with confidence because we remember the teachings of your son who came into the city in humility, 
yet filled with the power of your grace. And with that humble grace gave us the gift of salvation. We come calling praise on your name because you did not abandon us. You did not leave us wandering in a spiritual desert of our own making, but came into the world in Jesus. You came then and you come now by your spirit to lead us out of the wilderness. The wilderness that we have made of the civilizations we built. So Father of all grace, pour out your spirit on us now. Breathe into these moments of worship and break through into our lives and hearts by the silent power of our communal worship so that we may recognise the nature of your call to us. Transform us so that our lives may better reflect the purpose and the wonder of your creation. Forgive us so that those amongst whom we live and work may see in us as one community of love, your love in action, even through our imperfections. And empower us so that those who turn from your wonder in proud shame may turn again to see your name proclaimed in the humble acts of those who defy evil by speaking the truth to power. And so that the eternal truth of your love may illumine the lives of all your people, we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. And now we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. And forgive us our wrongdoings as we forgive those who wrong us. Do not bring us to a time of trial, but deliver us from all which is evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We now join again in the singing of our second hymn, which is 265 in Singing the Faith, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Ed Lansdowne will now read for us our Gospel lesson, which is from Mark 11, verses 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent out two of his disciples. He said to them, Go to the village ahead of you. 
Just as you enter it, you'll find a donkey's colt tied there. No one has ever ridden it. Untie it and bring it here. Someone may ask you, why are you doing this? If so, say, the Lord needs it. But he'll send it back here soon. So they left. They found a colt out in the street. It was tied at a doorway, and they untied it. Some people standing there asked, What are you doing? Why are you untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to. So the people let them go. They brought the colt to Jesus. They threw their coats over it. Then he sat on it. Many people spread their coats on the road. Others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those in front and those in back shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but it was already late. So he went out to Bethany with the twelve. We thank the Lord for his word. Our next hymn is number 262 from Singing the Faith, or Glory, Lord and Honour. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. One of the most difficult things any preacher is asked to do is to preach from a text so familiar that every nuance, every metaphor, every angle has been dragged out of it and it sits on the page and in the mind like the squeezed out rind of a Shrove Tuesday lemon. 
pretty much every Renaissance artist, every musician of note, oh, and Andrew Lloyd Webber, many prominent filmmakers and even many poets and authors have given their take on the events of what we Christians now call Holy Week. So much so that I'm pretty sure that there's a whole generation of Christians now approaching retirement who, if asked in meditation or prayer to picture an encounter with Jesus, See Robert Powell's startling and unblinking blue eyes staring out from his gaunt face in Zeffirelli's film. So what more is there to say about what most versions of the Gospel entitle the triumphal entry? That it was planned and prepared for is admitted in the text itself. Someone might wish to argue that it was the divine Christ who knew that there would be a donkey available and that its presence was just one more miraculous sign that the whole event was in the plan and in the hands of God. But I tend more to the theory that the human Jesus and his extensive network of supporters, some more covert than others, recognised that things were coming to a head politically and that those who wished him ill, though previously disparate and splintered, were beginning to coalesce around the awareness of his growing threat to their grasp on power. And that threat needed to be answered with a plain and public statement of Jesus' own understanding of his identity and role. That doesn't mean, of course, that it was any less, any the less within God's plan, nor that the whole scenario which played out was some kind of mummer's play with everyone playing a fixed and recognised part with a fixed and unchangeable script. All the actors in the drama could, in fact, have at any time torn up the script they thought they needed to play, in response to the statement Jesus made by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey over the Mount of Olives, which would have clearly been seen as a declaration of victory, as if the battle had already been fought and the king's enemies defeated. And that, for me, is one of the major points of Palm Sunday. Clearly, it's the first point of no return for Jesus, as he throws down the gauntlet to the powers and principalities, but it's also one of the unequivocal switch points for his disciples also. This event may well have crystallised for them too, their faith and their allegiance. I'm not talking about the crowds here. They may well have known about Jesus, maybe even have heard him speak and preach and seen him heal, but we all know how fickle crowds are. You only need to be a football supporter to know that. I'm sure there are many Manchester United supporters in the environs of Greater Manchester, although friends in the area tell me that there are and have always been more Manchester City supporters than Manchester United. But the joke about how many Manchester United fans does it take to change a light bulb at Old Trafford? Two, one to change the light bulb and the other to drive him up from Surrey is funny because it's true. The true measure of all support for a football team or any other entity is not to be measured when the scarves are waving at a victorious cup final or Premier League victory parade, but when the team you profess to support has managed to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory again by, say, I don't know, losing a second leg 3-0 when all you had to do to go through to the next round was not lose 3-0. That one comes to mind for some reason. And it wasn't going to be when the palm leaves were being waved and the cloaks were being cast in front of the donkey that Jesus' victory would be calibrated or his support measured. It was going to be when the crowds who'd called him king were then calling for his death, that the disciples will be required to make their stand. And as we know, and we'll recall in this coming week, most of them quailed from making that stand and most of them failed. But even then, that bitter betrayal was to be redeemed by the grace of God in the person of Jesus, as we know. I'm sure there isn't a human being alive who does not harbour regret at some aspect of their lives, some decision made or action they took in plain sight or in private. If anyone tells you they've never had, that they never have regrets, tell them from me that in that case they've only ever lived at the shallow end of life's swimming pool. One of mine would seem to virtually everyone else to be absolutely insignificant, but it shaped me later in ways I only truly discovered as I grew to some kind of maturity. I was 11, going on 12, and I'd just started to go to Boys Brigade. I'd been introduced to the Boys Brigade by a lad named Roger, who was in my English class. I wasn't entirely sure of what I did or didn't believe, even though I'd been an intermittent attender at Sunday school through my junior school years. So when we got into an RE lesson one day, and I was sitting next to Roger, I was 
faced with a crisis. We had a supply teacher, as our school attainment band often did. And the RE teacher was, looking back on it, an unreconstructed Marxist who spent the entire lesson in front of a class of boys completely rubbishing faith of all kinds and Christianity in particular. I don't remember the whole of his diatribe, but he had the whole class, or nearly the whole class, of prepubescent boys roaring with laughter at his stinging blows against organised religion. It was actually a cheap attempt at courting popularity, but it didn't feel like it at the time. It felt like we had a cool teacher. He finished by saying that no one rational could believe that pie in the sky when you die nonsense, and if any of us did, I bet none would stand up and say so. There were a few moments of silence, and then the sound of a chair scraping on the floor as my friend Roger pushed his chair back, stood up, and said, quietly but firmly, I do, sir. I believe in God, and I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then he just stood there as a torrent of abuse, and rolled up pieces of paper were hurled at him by his classmates. And I, who he'd befriended, well, I sat there. And although I wanted to, couldn't bring myself to rise to my feet and stand with him. And that's something I regret to this day. I don't want to be too hard on my 11-year-old self. If I could go back in time to that dusty classroom in an old building in Wellington Avenue, Chingford, and stand with a friend when he needed someone to stand with him, I'd be pushing my 11-year-old self to his feet. But it taught me a lesson. Faith ought not to be a bolt-on extra a luxury in which we only indulge when times are good and when it doesn't inconvenience the fulfilment of personal ambition or comfort or wealth or popularity. Cheering from the sidelines is all very well, but faith is only truly measured in the teeth of the wind of adversity. A few days after Easter Day, it will be the 76th anniversary of the murder and martyrdom in Flussenberg concentration camp of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was, in my opinion, and in the opinion of people I respect, one of the greatest theologians of the 20th or any other century, and his books are still read to this day by many people, when much of the output of his possibly equally gifted contemporaries falls by the popular wayside. He was arrested and imprisoned for taking part in the July 1944 plot to oust the Nazis from power by assassinating Hitler, because he saw it as his Christian duty to take action to prevent further evil. I think his books are still read and still seen as relevant, as much because in his life he didn't just wave the palm leaves or cry Hosanna in the glorious sunshine of the Mount of Olives, but took his faith and his love to the Gethsemane of Tegel Prison in Berlin and to the Golgotha of Flossenburg, beyond both of which it was redeemed by the Christ he served and shared, through his teachings, yes, but most of all by his example. Churches lose their way, not when they cease to be popular, but when they seek popularity at all costs. Churches may find themselves again when they recognise their call, which is not to embrace or endorse power, but when at all times it's prepared to challenge the holders of power, noisily and brashly and boldly if necessary, and to stand alongside the powerless and impoverished, and against the plutocrats and overprivileged. Faith isn't only about palm leaves and processions. As we will discover, it's also about passion, resurrection and redemption. Amen. Janet now leads our intercessions. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, over the broken glass of our world, the rumours meant to hurt, the prejudice meant to wound, the weapons meant to kill, ride on, trampling our attempts at disaster into dust. Ride on, ride on in majesty. Over the distance which separates us from you, And it is such a distance, measurable in half-truths, in unkept promises, in second-best obedience. Ride on until you touch and heal us who feel for no one but ourselves. Ride on, ride on in majesty 
through the back streets and the sin bins and the sniggered at corners of the city where human life festers and love runs cold. Ride on, bringing hope and dignity where most send scorn and silence. Ride on, ride on in majesty, for you, O Christ, do care and must show us how, on our own, our ambitions rival your summons and thus threaten good faith and neglect God's people. In your company and at your side, we might yet help to bandage and heal the wounds of the world. Ride on, ride on in majesty, and take us with you. Amen. Thank you, Janet. Our final hymn is 546, Behold the Servant of the Lord. And now may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us always. Amen. <laughs>